Welcome to the Road to Autonomy. I'm your host, Grayson Brulte. On today's episode, we're absolutely honored to welcome Ian Rust, founder and CEO of Revoy. Ian, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Grayson. Excited to be here. It's great to have you here. Hybrids are booming. We look in the passenger side. It's offering a really great sustainable solution. It's a really great solution for a consumer that's being squashed under inflation. On the Class 8 side, there really hasn't been much movement. And then Mike Plentia from Ryder calls up and says, you got to talk to Ian. You got to talk to Revoid. They're really, really doing something. How are you approaching this hybrid technology around electrified trailers for the Class 8 market? Yeah, absolutely. So we view hybrid as definitely the most viable solution for electrification in the class eight market. The reason why we hadn't really seen it before is that the drive cycles of tractor trailers don't really support the traditional sort of Prius style hybrid, i.e. you have to bring in a charge. They typically spend most of their life traveling at full speed on the highway, and there's not really much opportunity to harvest energy uh, to make that you know, uh, Prius style hybrid work. And so what we do is we bring in a pre-charged battery pack uh, that hybridizes the tractor trailer with energy coming in. Is the pre-charged solution what helps you stand out in the market? Because if you look at your customers or potential customers, one of the key metrics is uptime, uptime, uptime. And you're helping them with that. Tractor trailers make their money by moving loads. And they're only able to do that if they're on the road. And that's a really important part of our technology. Maybe just taking a step back, what we make is a entirely new type of electric vehicle. This is something that's Never been seen before on roads before last year when we rolled this out to our customers. And so what we're seeking to do with our product is make electrification of tractor trailers not just possible today, but the clearly most advantageous way to run freight regardless of being being an electrification solution. So what our vehicle does is it hooks up in between a tractor and a trailer. And it's able to instantly integrate with any tractor trailer on the road in a matter of minutes. The way we're able to do this is that it hooks up to the tractor just like a trailer and it hooks up to the trailer just like a tractor. And what I mean by this is there's no need for any CAN bus integrations or hardware modifications to the truck in order to hook it up. It uses the exact same airlines, J560 electrical, upper lower fifth wheel connection that the industry has been using for many, many years for a very long time. And what we do is we have sensors in the hitch as well as the airlines and most importantly, advanced robotics algorithms that allow us to use those sensors and that legacy interface to make our vehicle cooperate with the driver and help them haul their load. And that help comes in the form of renewable electric power. And when you help source the power for the vehicle from this electric source, it's coming in through torque on wheels. What that does is it reduces the power demand on the diesel engine and actually makes it almost vanish entirely, which drives huge increases in efficiency. So what's really cool is that by bringing in that pre-charge battery pack, we can integrate in under five minutes. And that takes a what is on average a six MPG tractor trailer. That's what diesel tractor trailers get today on average. And they're typically struggling for 10, 20, 30 percent MPG improvements. What we can drive is actually many multiples of MPG. So, for example, in San Francisco, where we run our R&D operations, we actually just set a uh, brand new record of 67 67 MPG, uh, which is an over 1100 percent increase uh, in MPG. So really, really dramatic and just a step change in terms of tractor trailer efficiency. How do you see the 67 miles MPG changing based on terrains? You're in Southern California, there's hilly, you can go to Southern California, you you go to the grapevine, and there's other areas that it's frankly flat. You can go through Kansas for 600 miles, 700 miles, and it's just flat. So how is that going to impact the MPG and the efficiencies that you're unlocking? Absolutely. So hills are actually one of our strongest suits. What it does is our vehicle is bringing in extra power, right? And so when a trucker is doing a upward, uh, an upwards grade, they're doing a hill climb, we're able to assist them in that. And our testing in San Francisco, we test a lot on the 101 in the peninsula, which is a relatively flat road. But we also test on the 280, which is closer to the coast. It's sort of an up and down hilly route. And without the Revoy EV, a tractor trailer on that route will struggle to get 40, 45 mile, miles per hour on those uphills. Same goes if you're doing something like Donner Pass or the Grapevine. 
tractor trailers really do have to go a lot slower up those. But with our product, they can actually get close to or just full speed going up those hills. So just an even in California, 55 miles per hour up and down these hills, which means they'll just get to their destination quicker. And that's just kind of like a free win for them in terms of their day-to-day -day operations. You don't have to worry about them ending up like the Donner family, unfortunately, when they got stranded there in that snowstorm <laughs> years and years and years ago through the Sierras. What does that do from a safety perspective? Because a lot of individuals, I got to say, it, they're not nice drivers, they're bad drivers, and they do silly things on the on the road. Does this help increase the overall safety on the road since the trucks are able to keep up with the speed limit so you don't have an individual that's going 100 miles an hour says oh, oh, and, and, and tries to jerk around the trailer They're keeping up with the flow of traffic? Does that increase safety? Absolutely. So what we view our vehicle as is basically driver assistance. So it's always just helping the trucker do what they need to do. And part of what they need to do is operate safely on the road. The, the first way we drive, act as a driving assistant is what we covered just previously, which is the torque assist. It helps with the acceleration of the vehicle, maintaining speed, all of that. But what it also does is it does braking assistance. So we have regenerative braking on board. And so when the driver hits that brake, not only are they operating their traditional air brakes, they're also turning on the regenerative braking on the vehicle. And so what that is, additional braking power, so we can actually stop a tractor trailer with a Revoy EV applied 30% sooner, which is guaranteed to prevent rear-ending accidents, guaranteed to prevent losses from an insurance perspective for our fleets, and guaranteed to, on average, save some lives. The other benefit when we talk about that, that hilly scenario is we can help get, maintain full speed when going uphill, but then when you're going downhill, we act as a redundant braking system. So it's a system that is totally separate from that air brake system. It is an electrical regenerative braking system, which just redundant safety systems like redundant braking are a clear safety win. It also has its own air compressor and air brake system on board. So in a way it's triple redundant, which is again, a very important safety feature. Looking into the future, what we're, uh, what we're gonna be rolling out to our customers over the next year or two is more advanced safety features, things like Anti jackknife, anti rollover. Along with that, the extra speed allows for things like merging onto the highway or even just being on the highway to be more safe. Oftentimes, on ramps are not long enough <clears throat> to allow a tractor trailer to get up to full highway speed when they merge, which merging dif disparate speed traffic is just inherently dangerous. And so, if you can get up to a more similar speed to the traffic, well, that just makes that merging process even or makes that merging process safer. Or, for example, passing someone or mer changing lanes. All of this is just more nimble and, by that virtue, safer. Theory, you can get a, a rid of, in a way, with the runaway truck signs that you have out in, out west. You can technically eliminate that. So you laid the benefits out from a safety perspective. You mentioned insurance. How are the insurance companies thinking about your system and saying, great, this is a great way to, to mitigate losses? Or how are the insurance companies thinking about what you're developing at Revoy? We plan on just globally reducing insurance costs to the entire industry through these safety features. And so that's something insurance companies are always going to be excited about. If you can just mitigate losses, then that just r results in lower costs for everyone and better businesses for the insurance companies. Right now, there's just been a massive increase in the level of payouts for losses on tractor trailers. And so it's really important to do whatever we can to help our customers, the fleets, just reduce the rate of those losses. So absolutely, it's going to be a huge insurance win for our customers. They can reduce their insurance rate. They can actually survive because the margins are, are so slim. Sometimes only one, two, three percent. So you're, you're technically allowing a trucking family, that a lot of them are, are owner-operated to stay in business. How is the business model work? Because a lot of the smaller trucking companies, they can't afford to go out there and spend $500,000 for a full electric Class 8 Cascadia. How is your model for to say, listen, we want to do the right thing for the environment. We want to do a sustainable model. We want to increase our safety. We want to lower insurance. But oh, by the way, Ian, we can't write you half a million dollar checks. What's the model and how are you engaging that audience? I'm so glad you asked about this because what we really want to do is democratize access to electric trucking to all parts of the market. So right now, there's just been very small adoption of electric heavy trucks in the industry. As of middle of last year, it was about 867 heavy trucks, which is an extremely small percentage of the 3 million semi trucks on the road today. It's just there's basically been zero adoption. And what it has been because of these high costs is it's been relegated to large companies that can afford that half a million dollar price tag 
to run an experiment. What we seek to do is just make, like I said before, we want to make it just clearly the most advantageous and cheapest and safest option for all fleets, including small fleets, owner operators. And the way we do that is the way our product is billed is there's no money up front for our customers. And what it is, is it's a leasing model. So basically we charge them by the mile. And our fees plus whatever residual diesel that they're burning are always going to be equal to or less than what they're currently spending on diesel and no more. And that's not even including the insurance benefits, the maintenance benefits, for example, of reducing the load on that diesel engine are going to start accruing over time. So there's going to be all these second order benefits. But from the get go, just from a immediate point of use perspective, it's just clearly either equal to or cheaper in terms of cost, which is a way we can make this technology accessible to the entire industry, not just large fleets that can afford experiments. If you're operating a leasing model, who's going to own the asset? Revoy going to own the asset? Are you going to partner with a commercial bank to own the asset? Who's going to own that physical asset? Yeah. So um, we really like to take a page out of the book of how solar has come to be so dominant in the industry. Solar as of the present, is just very clearly the cheapest and best way to build new electricity generation. In fact, 60% new uh, planned electricity generation investment is solar right now in the country. And what that is driven by is basically solar is very, very cheap. And we want to use the same model for electrification of the tractor trailer. If you can just make it very clearly the best option, regardless of it being renewable, regardless of being electric, that will drive adoption. And most importantly, it will drive private traditional investment into our vehicles as well as our infrastructure because it is just clearly the best option. And so we'll take that exact same tact and have the exact same basically traditional financiers, project financing that have piled into solar. We're expecting that same phenomenon to happen once electric trucks with our product are able to be very clearly the best choice. Staying on the, on the solar front, we'll, we'll ping pong here for a minute. There was a lot in the early days of solar, there was a lot of regulatory issues where a lot of the utilities put their hands, up, nope, no way, nope, you're, you're cutting off our cash cow. No, no, no. We got over that and now solar is being deployed across the United States. I, on your side of the ping pong table, are there any regulatory hurdles that would stop the scaling of your system? Absolutely not. So what's really great is that our vehicle combined with the tractor trailer is 100% road legal on every single interstate highway throughout the country. And what that means is that there's any trucking fleet can just show up and apply our vehicle without any consideration for whether or not there's any regular, like it doesn't need to tie in with the utility system. It just needs to be used at point of use for and, and be usable at point of hookup for our customers. So absolutely, we're fully road legal, license plates. They're just running every single day on the interstate. And yeah, that's how we're able to go out to the market immediately and just scale to, to the entire market. What infrastructure is needed to scale? Just like any other heavy electric truck, um, the big thing that it requires along with the vehicle itself is infrastructure. So chargers and electricity supply, just like anything else. But what's and what's really important, though, is that this what this has produced is a chicken egg problem. And we saw this in the passenger vehicle market. For example, much ink has been spilled about how Tesla had to build the supercharger network to drive adoption of their passenger vehicles. And we just have the same problem about 10 or 100 X fold because of the higher power demands of a heavy truck EV. And so the, the chicken egg problem is this, is no one's going to build a high capacity electric vehicle charger if there aren't enough trucks on the road to see high enough utilization. That's just a bad investment. Same goes for the trucks. If I'm a fleet and I'm looking into buying an electric truck, I'm going to need to make sure that there's charging availability everywhere where I'm going to operate that electric truck. So it's truly a chicken egg problem of who moves first, who takes that first bit of risk. What we do is something completely different. And what we're doing is basically short-circuiting that chicken egg problem. And we combine the infrastructure, meaning the chargers and the electricity sourcing, we take care of that for our customer. And then the vehicle, which we are the OEM for, we deploy both of those together as a single product, which is this leased by the mile service. They just show up and they get a fully charged, pre-charged Revo EV, and it can hook up to their vehicle without really any consideration in terms of vehicle type or vehicle weight or anything like that. And then they go and they hit the road and get what they need, which is torque to move their load. That's what we supply our customers with. 
regardless of it being electric, regardless of it being renewable. And what makes this possible for us is that there's a very important property of the Revoy EV, and this really is super core to how it interacts with the trucking industry in the sense of it is purely additive. And what I mean by this is that the tractor trailer it's hooked up to can operate just fine without it. They can drop the Revoy EV and then they're right back to being just a regular tractor trailer, the same as they were before. When we deploy our vehicles, we tightly limit their area of operations. For example, in a deployment live that we have in Texas and Arkansas, um, our customer comes into our area of service in Dallas. We hop on and then they leave our area of service in Arkansas. We hop off. And what this means is our vehicles are only in that area in between those two hop off, hop on and hop off points. And so we only deploy chargers to those two endpoints. And so what that means is that when we deploy chargers, they're immediately getting high utilization. And then when we're deploying those vehicles with the chargers, they always have chargers where they are operating. So in that way, we're able to just solve the chicken egg problem of charging. They just go together is because of this ability to just hop on and hop off at will. It's the swapping model. You're, you're, you're operating a swapping model. Exactly. Well, who's going to build, this, let's call them the swap hubs. Who's going to build and operate those? Will that be Revoy? Will, will that be a partner? Will that be your, your customer? Who's going to build, manage, and operate those facilities? We call oh. our swapping station network a hybrid network in the sense of it can be any combination of first party, so owned, operated, built by us, there's also franchise possibilities with a third party doing all that stack themselves, and we're just supplying the vehicles and the chargers, and then also various mixes of ownership. One example is on this route in the, on the I-30 corridor in Texas and Arkansas. We run a first party station out of a city called Prescott, Arkansas. And then in Dallas, the other end, we run a swapping station out of our customer's freight. So we're entirely captive to that yard. And so really only... A lot of different models can work and can be adapted to the best configuration for wherever it may be. All you really need is just space to park a Revoy EV and a charger. That's all you really need to get these into and turn any location into a swapping station. From an energy perspective, there's horror stories. Talk to the Siemens, the Hitachis, the, the, the big energy providers of working with the utility. I've heard some nightmare scenarios. I talked to one very large fleet. And they wanted to put something in the middle of Wyoming. They said seven years. He says, okay, I'm going to renewable diesel. I'm very sorry. I can't wait seven years. I'll be long retired by then. How are you getting all the energy that you need to charge the Revoy systems that you're swapping hubs? Right now, we do the traditional thing, which is hook up to the grid. And yeah, there's a lot of challenges with hooking up to the grid. Transformer availability is close to... 16 months of lead time right now. It's very slow. And there's oftentimes upgrades you need to do behind the meter, things like substations. And we, we do that. We do source some of our power from the grid. But what we're also doing is we're building solar capacity because it is so cheap and it's clearly the best way to source electricity, right? That's why we're seeing 60% of new generation investment in solar. And so we're following that exact same trend. It's very, very cheap to build. One thing that's unique about our product is that we focus primarily on long haul. It comes for a lot of reasons. The, the big top line one is that long haul is very clearly the bigger side of the market. Over two thirds of the market in terms of miles driven is in a long haul scenario. But when it comes to electricity sourcing, what this allows us to do is to do certain things that make us less dependent on the grid itself. So we can do co-located solar installs out in the ample amount of space that there is when you get outside of city centers. We view that as one of the sort of traps of the current push for electrification with heavy trucks, which is that there's this assumption that because electric heavy trucks have short range, that they have to be used in a short haul, regional haul, drayage type application. But what's tough about that is that all of those applications are in areas where there is a lot of electricity to make very high rates when it comes to a comparison to diesel. So if you're in the port of Long Beach charging there, you're subject to very high peak demand charges. The base rate is very high just because there's a lot of consumption right there. But if you can get out into long haul, you now have the space to do things like solar installs or wind installs or whatever is the most effective way to generate your electricity, which drives down costs, which is actually one of the biggest barriers to adoption, right? Despite the advertisement to the contrary, electric vehicles, when applied to commercial trucking routes, are more expensive. And that's typically where these projects stall out, is that 
when trucking fleets go to spec out a electrified route, it comes back and it's more expensive. And that's usually where it stops because trucking is a fairly low margin industry, as you mentioned before, and green premiums are really hard to justify. And so right now, all the other options are more expensive. And so that's why it's, why it's so important for us to be just very clearly more cost effective, equal to or less than the current cost of an electric truck. The way we're able to do that is when you, we're taking it out into long haul and the way we're uniquely able to do long haul is the fact that the reason why long haul is, is considered impossible is because with that short range, with an electric semi, for example, when you do stop, it's a significant amount of downtime because you're waiting on the charge because the, the charger, the battery is integrated with the vehicle and you have to wait for the batteries to charge to get back out onto the road earning. Whereas with us, with our swapping methodology, they get back onto the road in four minutes. And so you can just have essentially uncapped long haul range on electric power by just stopping and swapping four minutes, stopping and swapping four minutes at infinitum. And that allows you to then source really cheap electricity, which is how you are able to make this economical for fleets. Four minutes swap. How? That's right. How are you doing it? You've got autonomy in there. You've got a wizard behind the curtain. How are you doing it? No wizardry involved. What it is, we have what amounts to a like fuel station attendant that right now remotely pilots. So with what amounts to a gamepad, they have throttle stick, a steering stick, a lot of other controls on the parking brake and things like that. And they just hop our vehicle off of the customer's truck. The, the customer has just put their truck in the park. We hop off, drop the trailer, and then drive off to go charge. And then a freshly pre-charged Revo EV comes over, grabs that trailer, hops it onto the back of the truck, and then the truck goes and hits the road. And that whole time, the driver can just be sipping coffee in the cab. They'll go out and do their pre-trip checks, but then they can go and hit the road. And that process, yeah, we've timed and it's four minutes. We are going to be automating that to further improve that time, but we found that without automation, time frame is totally sufficient for fleets to, to do this swapping procedure. It has basically zero effect on their operations. And in fact, we're able to stage our vehicles at locations that our customers are already making their stops for things like brakes or drop and hooks for their trailers. So it really is just drop in zero operational impact. That's a very important part of what we designed into the system is to make sure that it's very lightweight operationally for our customers. Automation, when will you introduce it? Will that be in a future product release? Will that be upon full commercialization or when, when will you introduce that? Because you have a background in automation. I do. Maybe taking a step back, philosophically speaking, what really excited me about Revoy in particular is that when you, when you take a step back and look at the unit costs of trucking, i.e. the cost per mile, what they're almost entirely driven by are labor and fuel. And those are the number one and number two costs. Depending on macro factors, they actually trade for that top spot. Right now, fuel is number two. But what's really interesting is that there's this whole crowded push into the labor side of things, which amounts to essentially labor arbitrage. And I've worked in robotics and automation my entire career. I studied robotics at MIT. I've been in the industry for over 12 years. And that's the general trend of automation and robotics is that it's meant as a labor replacement. But what's really cool about our tech is that we're not pointing it at labor arbitrage, essentially. That's what these are trying to do is remove the driver, replace it with sensors, software, et cetera. We're pointing it at a equally sized market, and in our opinion, a much more impactful market, which is the fuel market. And so what we're doing is we're taking electric vehicles and through robotics and automation, turning it not into a labor replacement, but a fuel replacement. And that's where this connects to our business model, where we are charging for it by the mile. It's based on usage, just like fuel. And just like fuel, you don't need to modify a diesel truck to quote unquote, fill up the tank with a Revo EV. It's just a pre-charged battery pack that that energy doesn't come in through the fuel tank. It comes in through the hitch. Automation is something that we believe is something that should just materially benefit everyone involved. And so what's so exciting about our technology is that it keeps the driver in the loop. It makes their life a lot easier. We're doing that trailer valet service, as we call it, where we're connecting and disconnecting the trailer. They're just taking a break. But when it comes to the things that truckers are really good at, which is driving, maintaining focus, keeping the vehicle safe, they're still running the show. And we're just acting as a driving assistant that helps them do what they need to do and do it more efficiently and safer. How large is the battery pack? Our battery pack right now is 525 kilowatt hours. And we're going to be coming out with a our new version of the vehicle later this year that has a 800 kilowatt hour. 
What type of range, if you were to operate battery only, could you achieve on that in the class eight scenario? That's actually one of the really cool parts that this purely additive feature of the vehicle allows us to do, which is that, for example, let's say you're using a Revoy EV and it runs out of battery. If you were driving an electric semi, that would be a pretty disastrous scenario because you would get stuck, you would need a tow, you would need to get another truck out there to actually complete the mission, bring the load to the place where it needs to go, which is very costly. And that's that's range anxiety. That's why people get worried about range. With us, I mentioned this before, that we're basically mixing in with our, our customers' current diesel power source, which is the internal combustion engine. And so... If we run out of battery, that diesel engine can kick in and just haul the vehicle. But when it comes to when both the electric system and the diesel system are active, the range can actually be flexible. So it's really just a trade-off of MPG improvement and, and range. So you could go 400, 500 miles with diminishing returns on MPG, or you can go shorter range and get really dramatic MPG. So right now, for our customer in Texas and Arkansas, we're more than doubling their MPG on a 240-mile range. But in, in California, we'll run at 180 miles of range and get that really high 67 MPG. And the way we're going to roll that out to all of our customers is with that larger battery pack and just extend the range. But the important thing to note is that it's very flexible. The range is not a hard constraint. It's something that can be adapted to whatever scenario. And that's part of what it what makes it work as a technology that works today. Are the scenarios play out based on strategically where the hubs are? So you have to start with, say, hub A to go to hub B, and then from hub B to go to hub C. Is this a, called a, a hub-to-hub model? Yes. We put our swapping stations where you would see a conventional truck stop that sells diesel right next to the highway. And so what they would do is just exit the highway with their spent Revoy EV, do a swap, and then go back and hit the road. It's really just a alternate fuel source for our customers. And yeah, we'll be putting those stations at regular intervals on the major freight lane. So right now we're on the I-30. We're going to be moving to the I-10, the I-5 in California and Oregon. And just, yeah, always hit those really high volume uh, uh, freight lanes. And then, you know, relating back to the, this, you know, purely additive hop on, hop off methodology is that we don't need to do the full trip distance of that truck. So if there is a long trip after they get off the highway, into let's say they have to drive 30 miles to the farm where they're picking up a load of potatoes, right? We'll just let them do diesel on that section. And then when they go back and hit the highway, that's when they'll apply our vehicle and get those really deep MPG savings. So it's very flexible in that regard. You can fractionally any subsection of any of our customers route and naturally grow that out as we expand our footprint with these swapping stations. I want to take that one step further. I'm going to give you a very, very common truck route. Lee White, thanks for the, the input on lanes, sir. He's great on lanes, so I'll give you a shout out there. Let's hypothetically say Port of Savannah to DFW region. It could be anywhere in that region and runs on your system. And then from there, I have to go to San Antonio or Oklahoma City. Would I could just run that on traditional diesel. I can drop it. Or at that point, I could swap it and get another one of your systems at that point. That's right. To use that example from Savannah to DFW, what we would do is we would have a swapping station in Savannah itself where you would apply that first Revoy EV and then dot that route. I think that would require about three swapping stations, depending on the exact range and route that they're taking between that Savannah and DFW, and then just do hops. Drive four hours approximately, swap out the vehicle, take a small break drive for our hours, et cetera, et cetera. And then, yeah, if they ever encounter a situation where they're sort of at the the frontier of our network, at that last terminal, they just drop it off and then revert back to diesel and then carry on. This is part of that low operational impact where they can just run the exact same trailers, exact same routes, et cetera. Can the truck driver operate your system? Let's say the battery's depleted. Can, can they keep going or do they have to pull to the side? Or what happens in, in that type of scenario? In that type of scenario, no, they just, when our battery pack runs out of juice, it just turns into a plain old regular truck axle. And so they can just continue hauling their load. There's no longer any torque assist because there's no more power left in the vehicle. But no, it's not the end of their journey. They can continue on to wherever they're going and complete the mission, which is a really big difference from the electric semi. It's a big difference. It's not a, I'll use a car analogy you don't have, or a boat analogy. You don't have to send out an, an SOS or, or call AAA, hi, I'm stuck. You can keep going. Think about the, the impact on the operation because once one domino falls, then you have this domino effect across the entire supply chain, across the entire organization, and somebody's getting a nasty phone call or a not nice phone call. 
trying to explain technology, but but you're solving that problem. I'm going to go back to ports here because ports around, if you look at the, the data around ports in the United States or even globally, for a matter of fact, they all have one common denominator. They have a lot of access to energy. There's a lot of energy at ports. Do you see potential, it's potentially in the future, putting your transfer stations, your hub stations you're in and around near ports just because the amount, the vast amount of redundant energy that are in those locations and the amount of freight and cargo that's to and from those ports? Absolutely. That, that'll that be a, a secondary market for us. We're going to be starting outside of all that, out in the middle of the country, so-called over-the-road trucking. And then, yeah, we're definitely going to go into the ports. And really what it comes down to is just a matter of highest impact, near-term feasibility on the power sourcing side in terms of costs. We view long-haul long trucking as the most important part of our trucking system. And so we're going to tackle that first. Then we'll we'll definitely be tackling the ports as we take care of the, the middle of the country first. How has the market been reacting to your technology? What type of feedback have you gotten from some of the, the large fleets around the country? The feedback has been really positive. Where, where a lot of this effort for electrification is coming from is that trucking companies' customers have ESG commitments, and trucking is a fundamental part of the U.S. economy. It's essentially everybody's scope three emissions, as it's called. And every single company that has ESG commitments, they're asking their trucking providers to provide them with decarbonized options. And right now, with the traditional electric semi, that is not working out because they just are more expensive to operate. And so that's what's really important for our customers is that they're they're in the business of meeting the needs of their customers. It, it's just that the technology is not at a point previously that they could provide something that actually could do that effectively for their customers. Whereas with Revoid, they can help their customers hit those ESG goals and then have costs that are either less than or equal to their current costs. So it's just a net win for everybody involved. The day is going to come when you really make it, when you're reading a corporate sustainability or ESG report, and you see you know, Revoid mentioned there's a technology that helped meet the goals. Then, then you know you've made it. And then, you know, then the next, on the back half of that, your phone's going to ring with a lot of potential investors. And so it's a, well, it's a win-win all around. We, we were talking a couple of weeks ago before to have you on the podcast around the inspiration. You told this really great story about building an RC and putting it on a treadmill. Is that how this technology first started? Did you went from a treadmill to a Class 8 truck? It went from a, a Matchbox truck to a, to a Class 8 truck? Yeah, funnily enough, so I'd love to talk about the trajectory of the R&D, but funnily enough, the very first thing I built before we even started prototyping any of the technology was a financial model. And it's because when we talk to fleets, cost is king. It's really important to make this a economical option. And being able to make it economical in a financial model is the first thing you have to do for it to even be a viable technology in the space, in my opinion. But yeah, once, once we saw that this could be really something that's viable for our customers from a dollars and cents perspective, what the next thing to do there is to start building the, the, the technology. And so funnily enough, the production vehicles that we have out on the road today, they're the first ones that the general public and our customers are seeing. But internally, that's actually our fifth version of the vehicle that we've been developing with over two and a half years of R&D. The first one started out as an RC scale, 114th scale tractor trailer on a treadmill. We sort of gradually upped the scale of the vehicle from something that we called either scooter scale or bicycle scale, then moving to full scale at a prototype level, then production prototypes, and then ultimately a production vehicle. That whole time developing simulation systems to make sure that the software is thoroughly tested, very safe, going through functional safety analysis, and really making sure that the end product for the customer is a very polished and very reliable solution for them. That's what we've been able to deliver to our customers through that rapid iteration, which is something we really specialize in. Well, listen, I'm going to recap this for our audience. Excel to treadmill to scooter size, to production vehicle, to commercialization. That's pretty impressive. That can make a really great little 60 second, 90 second video there. I give you a lot of credit. You're one of the only founders that said the most important thing, you started with the financial model first. You didn't just build the product. Why? I'm thoroughly of the opinion that it doesn't matter what sort of technology you make. If it's not something that people want to use and that they can use, it's going to be a moot point. It's going to be a demonstration maybe of an interesting concept but it's not something that's going to make an impact. And in, in my opinion, the way we make electrification happen of heavy trucks is 
getting back to that idea of solar, right? It just needs to be very clearly the better product, regardless of it being electric or renewable. It just needs to be better. And that's really important. And that's what we're in the business of doing, is just making the trucking system and better for everybody involved. You want to make it better. How will it change as you scale and you enter commercial operation? Will, this, will it get smaller? Will it get bigger? Will it just get longer range? How, how do you see it changing? Because it's going to get better, but but what's the, the nuts and bolts of, of making it better? When I say better, I mean better than the status quo, which it currently is. But yeah, it can definitely improve. We're going to be continuing to develop this technology for as long as we can. And the big way that it's going to change is the growth of our swapping network. So right now we focus on long haul routes out in different parts of the country, building these two-ended routes, small scale, hop on, hop off. And we're just going to be building and branching off of that network in a very iterative fashion, all supported by revenue. That concept of only deploying chargers with full utilization and only deploying vehicles with full charger availability by limiting the area of the vehicle. And so what the next step is expanding the area of the vehicle. That's going to be the biggest thing that's going to change. Another thing is we're still at the beginnings of the um, uh, light weighting of the vehicle. So right now it is our vehicle weighs 22,000 pounds. And for our customers, weight is very important. And that's actually one of the more interesting bits of feedback we've gotten for our customers, which is that for them, despite there being the added weight, what it is actually zero payload impact. And this is just another one of those really important aspects of that that core feature of the vehicle, which is that it's purely added in the sense of our customers can always revert back to diesel, be it with if the battery pack gets fully depleted or they leave our area of service. What we also do is we weigh the trailers for our customers on a trip by trip basis. So before they even apply the Revo EV, we know whether or not the Revo EV plus payload plus truck is within that 80,000 pound limit. If it is, great. We hop on and we provide fuel savings, all these optimizations that we talked about previously. But if it doesn't fit, well, that's also fine. You can just go back to what you were doing before. And it turns out, actually, when you look at the data from the Federal Highway Administration, two thirds of trucks can actually currently support that additional battery weight. And what's really unique about our product is that for those cases where it can't fit, we're very flexible. We can just hop off and just let them revert back to what they were doing. You can't do that with a permanent modification to the vehicle, uh, whether it's batteries in the tractor or batteries in the trailer. What you're doing when you add extra weight to either of those components is you're violating an implicit social contract in the industry, which is that any trailer can be loaded in any way, excepting heavy loads or wide loads, which require special permanents, but your conventional freight. They're never having to think about, oh, this truck can only go up to 35,000 pounds, so we got to be careful to do it. That's not something that they're currently having to think about. And so by making them think about it, it's sort of violating the, the, the way things are currently working. But by making electrification modular, meaning it can be in a matter of minutes reconfigured to being mostly electric or the status quo, it allows you to restore that social contract. So our customers don't need to think about how they're loading their trailers. They don't need to think about which trucks they're using. They do the exact same thing they were doing before. We just go and measure the weight and selectively apply ourselves when it makes sense. And so in terms of what that will mean for future versions of the vehicle is that percentage of tractor trailers that we'll be able to apply ourselves to will just in increase and increase as we continue to optimize and do annual or more frequent refreshes of the actual vehicle. Think about it. If you have an electric class eight, you could it could be toilet paper, bounty, potato chips. You can't run soda or water in it because of the, the weight issues. But your system, what you're saying is that you want to run soda one day, you want to run chips the next day. Okay, no problem. We just put your system on for the chips. We don't put it on for the soda. From a cost savings perspective, that's pretty astronomical because now suddenly you don't have the dedicated chip truck. You can optimize your network efficiency that you're really going to unlock which is something today with Class 8 Electric you cannot do. With that being stated, when are you going to commercialize this? Because there's a pretty big market out there based on data and consumer demand. We're actively commercialized right now. So we're running paid loads every single day in Texas and Arkansas. And so really what the commercialization journey for Revoy is expansion. We're just going to be getting out to more routes. Right now we're in Texas and Arkansas. We're going to be building a route in California, perhaps several, as well as Oregon and Washington state. And so 
Those are all going to be nucleus or nucleation sites of our network where we're doing these two-ended, short-range swapping networks. But as those naturally expand, we add another stop, we add another stop. There, Because the national highway system is connected to itself, they're just naturally going to merge. And so at that point, what we'll have is an actual network, which ultimately the form of this is that it's entirely self-served. A owner operator could hear about the revoice system five minutes before arriving at a revoice swapping station from a billboard, and they can hook it up in under five minutes and go and hit the road and go electric that way. Which when you compare that to what going electric looks like today, which is this half a million dollar truck, you got to figure out charging infrastructure, you got to figure out electricity sourcing. It's a much, much more seamless transition that just is pure upside for the trucking industry rather than this really fraught decision that is proving to be very challenging. The all electric is, is very challenging. I'm very bullish on hybrid. You're, you're offering the hybrid solution, but you're also giving the economics where it makes sense to deploy and you're not limiting what you can and cannot carry, you're giving options and options are what matters. And that, that to me, what, what hybrid enables. Your opinion, what is the future of hybrid solutions for class A trucking? I do think the end point ultimately is all electric. Eventually there will be breakthroughs in battery chemistry. There will be other options available, like technology will progress, but right now it just doesn't work. And so the way I see it is that this is something that can provide value immediately. And so we should just start now since there is immediate value. And what it really is, what we're going to be moving towards is allowing for much more flexibility on the full electrification solution. And so what I mean by this is that right now we're adding this vehicle that is basically a whole redundant powertrain. It's actually stacked to pull the entire vehicle. But what that means is that the power requirements on that tractor in the front now drop to a very low amount. And so as once we get a sufficiently critical mass of our swapping network where a customer can operate their entire day on the Revoy network, what that means is that they can go electric in a way that, or fully electric in a way that is extremely economical in the sense of that front tractor doesn't need to be have a megawatt hour battery pack and cost half a million dollars. It can have the battery pack the size of a Nissan Leaf. It can weigh as much as a Nissan Leaf and cost as much as a Nissan Leaf, which will be a huge driver of capital efficiency industry. When your key bit of assets, i.e. the trucks, can be half as much, a third as much, and be electric. So that's what I view as the future as hybrid, is that not only is it something that can provide value today, but it provides a much better solution for when we go all the way electric. So it bridges the gap, but also get, gets you into an area that you never would have been able to do on all electric, which is just strictly better. It's a much better solution. Economically makes sense, but most importantly, gives the opportunity for your sustainability goals today, not tomorrow. Ian, as we look to wrap up this insightful conversation, what would you like our listeners to take away with? I think the big thing is this, is that electric vehicles up until the present in the passenger vehicle space, which is where they've been the most successful, have predominantly been luxury products. I've been happy to see a lot of that change in the past five, five odd years, but that has been the history. And what we really shouldn't be doing is taking that technology stack that was for a luxury product and copy pasting it into a commercial asset which is what heavy trucks are. Heavy trucks have to return an ROI. Luxury vehicles do not. And that is a very different way of doing things. And when you have those new constraints and those new values in, in what the industry wants in terms of the product, we're going to have new products. We can't expect for basically just doing the same thing but electric to actually be the way we get through this. With new technologies comes new advantages and new constraints, which ultimately needs new products. And that's what we've developed. We've developed how electrification can be adopted by the industry in a way that actually works for them, given the advantages and constraints of the industry, uh, electric vehicles. So some advantages, for example, are it can be cheaper per mile. If you source your electricity properly, and you have a long lasting, high asset value vehicle, which is what we've done, engineered it from the start as an asset. You have this constraint of lower range, but if you run a swapping system, that now is lower impact, right? And so that's the type of approach we should be taking really for any new technology is not just using path dependence from a luxury product to drive how we do things. Let's really think about it from the ground up and do something that works. Build for the use case. 
the luxury EV market is, is tanking. BYD announced a $10,000 electric vehicle. They're going to build in Mexico. That's going to be scary, but you have to build for the use case. A passenger vehicle is different than a Class 8 vehicle. They always will be. You even have to have a special license called a CDL to drive a Class 8 vehicle, and eventually they'll be autonomous, but they're still different. The future is bright. The future is autonomous. The future is Revoy. Ian, thank you so much for coming on the road to autonomy today. Thank you so much, Grace. Another great time.